Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just one little note before the service. It has to do with the last hymn we're going to sing today, 376. The first printing of our synod's hymnal had a fun little typo. It printed verse 5 twice. So the newer printings don't have that. But if you're so blessed to have a hymnal which says there's six verses of 376, don't sing the sixth one unless you want to have a little solo. <laughs> it's a free country, but this, now you know. A couple times, I haven't noticed this until we were literally singing that hymn. So now I can say I told you. For the liturgy, we're going to be following the Bugenhagen Liturgy Rite 1, which begins with the opening prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing hymn 56. Please rise. Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
hear the holy and comforting word of our Lord. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lift up your hearts. By the authority of God and of my holy office, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, of your fatherly goodness, you allow your children come on, to come under your chastening rod here on earth, that we might be like your only begotten Son, in suffering and hereafter in glory. We beseech you, comfort us by your Holy Spirit in all temptations and afflictions, that we may not fall into despair, but continually trust in your Son's promise that our trials will endure but a little while and then be followed by eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Lamentations chapter 3. So I say, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Here ends the Old Testament reading. We now continue with the verses of Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. 
He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord, mighty and powerful. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives food to the beast and to the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. The epistle reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Here ends the epistle. We now sing the first four verses of hymn 377. Thank you.
The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning with the 16th verse. Jesus said, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. confess the holy Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing verses 5 through 8 of hymn 377.
Dear Christians, whose sorrow will turn to joy, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's Gospel reading from John 16 gives us a glimpse into the upper room on Maundy Thursday when Jesus was getting his disciples ready for all that was about to happen. Soon, Jesus was going to be arrested by the soldiers Jesus, Judas led to the Garden of Gethsemane. The day after that, Jesus was going to be condemned, crucified, and buried. That's what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples, a little while and you will see me no longer. In a little while, Jesus was going to be taken away from them. He would be dead. During that time, the disciples would weep and lament. They would be afraid and filled with regret for how they had run away from Jesus even though they had all vowed that they were not going to. And while the disciples were filled with sadness because Jesus had been taken away from them, they assumed forever. The enemies of Jesus had the exact opposite reaction. The chief priests and the Pharisees rejoiced because Jesus was God. They would no longer have to listen to him calling them children of the devil or calling them to repentance for their sins and threatening their influence and authority with the people of Israel. But Jesus also told his disciples that again, in a little while, they would see him. And when that happened, their sorrow would turn into joy. Jesus was predicting what would happen on Easter evening. There, Jesus appeared to his disciples as they were huddled together in a locked room. He showed them the marks of his crucifixion. He forgave them for their sins. He lifted off the guilt and the fear that had been pressing down onto them. Jesus turned their sorrow into joy so much that the previous two days, which had seemed like an eternity for the disciples, really were just a little while, as Jesus had said. But after Jesus rose back to life on Easter and appeared to his disciples, Jesus did not stay with them forever. There were two meanings for what Jesus told his disciples on Maundy Thursday. Jesus was preparing them for when he was taken away by his crucifixion and death. And he was preparing his disciples for when he was taken away from them 40 days after that, when he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. When that happened, the disciples knew that Jesus wasn't gone from them completely. Jesus had promised his disciples, and he promises all Christians, that he is always with us through his word and the sacraments. But it's still true that after his ascension, Jesus was no longer with his disciples in the same way that he had been for the last three years, living with them, walking with, is walking with them in Israel, teaching them face to face. And just as the disciples had wept and lamented in the little while between Jesus' death and when he rose back to life, after Jesus ascended out of their sight, the disciples were also given plenty of reasons to weep and lament. Except maybe for St. John, to whom Jesus entrusted the care of his mother Mary, all the other disciples were martyred for their faith. They were stoned or beheaded or killed in more creatively cruel ways because they were carrying out the Great Commission in faith towards God and in love for the rest of the human race. No matter how strong their faith was in their crucified and risen Lord, we can be sure the disciples did not enjoy being killed. It hurt. For some of them, the pain was drawn out and excruciating. But then what happened? They saw Jesus again, just like he promised. And when the souls of the disciples were carried by God's angels to heaven, whatever wounds had been inflicted by them by the forces of evil and unbelief were forgotten. Whatever tears they had shed were dried. There was no more hunger or thirst or persecution, or temptations for sin, as is true for all of God's saints in heaven. Now, we were not with Jesus and his disciples in the upper room on Maundy Thursday. We did not 
hear these words from Jesus when he first spoke them. We were also not yet alive to experience the same fear and shame that the disciples felt in between Jesus' death and resurrection. But when Jesus first spoke these words to his disciples, he knew that one day they would be recorded by inspiration for all Christians to hear. He knew that you would hear these words. So in them, Jesus is also speaking to you. We did not experience that first little while between when Jesus was crucified and then came back to his disciples. But we are experiencing the second little, little while with the disciples and with all Christians. We are also waiting to see Jesus again. And during this time, we are given reasons to weep and lament. We see our friends and family sick and dying. We hear new reports every day of disasters, both natural and very much man-made. Because we live in the world, we see and we feel the increasing weight of sin bearing down upon it. But then there are also those reasons to weep and lament that we experience specifically because we are Christians. Every day, we are tempted to sin against, by, against God's word. These temptations come from the unbelieving world and from our own sinful flesh. When we give in to these temptations, we feel the shame and guilt for our sins like the disciples felt shame and guilt because they had run away from Jesus. And when we don't give in to these temptations, but by God's strength, we cling to his word and we confess what it says, then the unbelieving world mocks and criticizes us. We don't embrace the things they embrace. We don't reject the things they reject. We don't say the world is our final home and goal. We are God's people. We are strangers here. Our home is in heaven. And those are just the reasons to weep and lament that we know from our own lives. We are also saddened sometimes even more by the far greater persecution that Christians in other parts of the world face. Churches are burned to the ground. The homes and possessions of Christians are taken away from them because they are Christians. Christian families are locked up in concentration camps because they refuse to renounce Jesus. And of course, Christians are killed for their faith. As we see these things happening in our lives and around the world, the temptation is to give up. The temptation is to stop waiting to see Jesus again during this little while which seems to be dragging on forever. The temptation is to join the rest of the world in unbelief, focusing on the here and now and nothing else. Jesus gives us these words of encouragement that we hear from him today because he knows that we need to hear them. He gives us the example of the sorrow of the disciples being turned to joy as a picture of how things are going to be for us when we see Jesus again, too. Because when that day comes, either at our deaths or when Jesus returns in glory, whichever comes first, then all the wounds that have been inflicted onto us will be healed. All the tears that we have shed in the face of sickness, death, and persecution will be dried. Then the time of suffering and sadness, which seems to last possibly all of our lives, really will seem like a little while compared to an eternity with God and the rest of his saints in heaven. Jesus uses a very vivid picture to illustrate this for us. Sometimes in his parables and his teaching, Jesus used examples that really only make sense if you either grew up in the ancient world or on a farm. But childbirth is not one of those things. Childbirth is something that makes sense for everyone, as it will for the rest of time. When a woman is in labor, she is in pain. And usually, the pain gets worse and worse and worse. And she and her husband and the doctors and the nurses, they don't know how long it's going to be until that increasing pain stops. It's like living as a Christian in this fallen world. Things keep on getting worse. 
the world is showing more and more animosity to God's word and those who believe it. And we don't know how long this is going to go on. But then the childbirth stops. The baby is born. The woman sees the little one that she has been agonizing and working to give birth to for who knows how long. And her husband, who didn't actually feel her pain, but certainly felt the fear and uncertainty of what was happening for his wife, he is released from that too. And together, they get to see the new little gift from God, the son or the daughter, or sometimes both. And all the pain and uncertainty that came before it is forgotten. The sorrow is turned to joy. Even more than that, will be the effect that Jesus has on your sorrow that you experience in life when you see him again. Even more than that, will cries be turned into laughter. Even more than that, will tears of sadness be turned into tears of joy. Jesus promises you. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we especially remember two people. One is Annette, who is a friend of the Body family, and we also continue to remember in our prayers Phineas Bader. Little Phineas, who is about three years old, he has experienced some setbacks in his health this week, so certainly he is needful and deserving of our prayers. So please rise as we pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Everlasting and merciful God, we beseech you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to have mercy upon us and to hear our prayer. Look in mercy upon your church. Protect it and sanctify it by your truth. May your word be taught in its purity and your sacraments be rightly administered. Grant to your church faithful pastors who shall declare your truth with power and shall live according to your will. Send forth laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant to them repentance unto life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your protecting hand be over our country and over all who travel. Prosper what is good among us and bring to naught every evil counsel and purpose. Protect and bless your servants the President of the United States, the Governor of this state, our judges and magistrates, and all in authority. Fit them for their high callings by the gift of your spirit of wisdom and fear, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your promise, O God, be the defender of the widow and the father of the orphan. Relieve and comfort the sick and the sorrowful. Graciously help those who are assaulted by the devil and who are in peril of death. Be the strength of those who are suffering for the sake of Christ's holy name. Grant that we may live together in peace and prosperity. Bestow upon us good and seasonable weather and bless us with upright Christian counsel in all that we undertake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We especially commend to your care and keeping this, your congregation, which you have bought with a great price. Keep from us all offenses and bind us together in the unity of your holy love. Grant that the little ones who are baptized in your name may be brought up in your fear. At your table, give to those who there commune with you peace and life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be merciful, O God, to all according to your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. When our final hour shall come, grant us a blessed departure from this world 
and on the last day, a resurrection to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Please rise for the preface. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. We lift up. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, but chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the very Paschal Lamb which was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world by his death. He has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
crucified and risen from the earth, strengthened through his early and true faith and the everlasting life, and imparts in this love. We continue by singing verses 4 through 6 of hymn number 310.
Please rise. Let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have refreshed us with these your salutary gifts. And we beseech you of your mercy to strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 You may be seated as we sing hymn 376. O Lord, we render unto you our heartfelt thanks that you have taught us what you would have us believe and do. 
Help us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, to keep your word in pure hearts, that we thereby may be strengthened in faith, perfected in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Amen. <laughs>